Welcome, everybody. It's uh, great to have everybody here. Later this evening, we will be honoring at our annual dinner General Brent Scowcroft with the Aspen Institute Public Service Award. It's given to that person who most exemplifies the values of democracy and shown coalition building. Well, I once wrote with a friend a book called The Wise Man, and every now and then people say, who are the wise men of today? You always start your answer with Brent Scowcroft. But one of the things about a wise man like Brent Scowcroft is that he makes everybody around him a little bit wiser. And so the wise women and wise men of today, you can always draw that dotted line and they seem to connect to Brent Scowcroft. In fact, Brent Scowcroft brought uh, Secretary Condoleezza Rice here, I think 24 years ago, to be part of the Aspen Strategy Group. I looked at the archives and I was able to find this picture from back then of Joe Nye and Condoleezza Rice. The darn thing about it is that you all haven't changed a bit in 24 years. You look exactly the same, but it does uh, show, and we'll, we will get this picture to both of you. We'll make you copies so you can frame it and keep it. I'm particularly appreciative of Dr. Rice for being here because I know that very special version of hell that she's in right now, which is in between when the copy editors have copy edited the manuscript of your book and you're trying to correct all of their uh, mistakes that they've put in by copy editing it. And she was working till 11 last night doing that. But in return, every one of you has to promise that on November 1st, when it becomes available on Amazon, you buy No Higher Honor by Condoleezza Rice. <laughs> Joe Nye comes out with a book every year, somehow. Uh, so whatever the new one is, Joe, we will buy it as well. I really want to thank Nick Burns and the entire crew of the Aspen Strategy Group for putting this together. And Nick, I turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Walter, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Pleasure to see everyone here. Um, I know that you're accustomed, because a lot of you are here frequently, to the very high standards of the Aspen Institute, to hard-hitting interviews, not letting the guest off the hook. And I just want to assure you, we're not going to meet those standards today. <laughs> And the reason is because Condi, Joe, and I are partisans of Brent. We have all worked for Brent with him. We're still working for Brent Scowcroft. And uh, we've come to praise him today. So here's the order of battle. I'm going to say a few nice words about our honored guest, the co-founder of the Aspen Strategy Group. Uh, he'll be honored tonight, Brent Scowcroft. And then we're going to interview Brent. And we've rehearsed this about his youth and about his start in government and some of the principal achievements and events in which he took place. And then Condi and Joe and I are going to talk and bring Brent into a conversation about his legacy as a public official and also look towards the future and talk about the rise of China and talk about what's going to happen to the U.S. military as a result of the pending budget cuts that Congress and the President agreed on this week. What's going to happen to the United States as the preeminent power in the world? So that's our agenda today over the next hour and a half. We'll get you involved in the conversation. We do have microphones. You'll have a chance to ask your own questions. The first thing I sh thought I should do, and these people really need no introduction, is to introduce this panel. Joe and I, you all know, is the co-founder 30 years ago of the Aspen Strategy Group. For decades, has been a very distinguished professor at Harvard University, dean of the Kennedy School of Government, and I think, and a lot of other people think, the preeminent theorist in the United States, perhaps in the world, about power. In fact, he's written a book, his most recent book, The Future of Power. And so if you're interested in knowing about the future balance of power, whether China is going to overtake the United States in power in the world, he's the man to ask. Condi Rice, professor at Stanford University, will be an author, already an author, coming out with her second book since she left um, the Secretary of State's position in November of this year, um, national security advisor, Secretary of State between 2001 and 2008, a very close associate, as is Joe, with Brent Scowcroft. Let me say a few words about Brent. He was born in Ogden, Utah, grew up in Utah, 
at the age of 19, went to West Point in 1944. He told me today he was in the last class. That was a three-year class at West Point. Graduated in 1947, pilot in the Army Air Corps for three months until the Air Force was created in September 1947. And then a long career in the Air Force, a very distinguished career, where he served um, as an office, staff officer on the Joint Chiefs of Staff, served at Air Force headquarters, served as assistant air attache in the United States Embassy in, in Belgrade, which became very important at the end of the 1980s and, and early 1990s as Yugoslavia disintegrated, and then had this extraordinary career at the White House. He began as a military assistant to President Nixon, and then was elevated, promoted to become Deputy National Security Advisor for President Nixon, and then President Ford, and then National Security Advisor for President Ford, and then after a brief period of time out of government, came back uh, in the presidency of George H.W. Bush and became National Security Advisor, the only individual in our history who has served twice in that position. Since leaving government, he has founded the Scowcroft Group. He is on the board, well, he's been on about 30 boards and shared them all with great distinction. But he is the president of the George H.W. Bush Presidential Library. He's the chair of the International Advisory Board of the Atlantic Council. Uh, he was knighted by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Very few Americans earn that distinct, distinction, and honored and, uh, as well by the government of the Federal Republic of Germany. Those are his, that's his career. Those are some of the principal positions he held, but I think the greatest distinction is this. I think if you took a poll of people in both political parties uh, who've worked in government at the highest level, they would say that Brent Scowcroft is the most trusted and respected senior official that we have in the United States today, and I think that's his greatest honor. I hope you do too. <laughs> now, the reason he's looking a little bit sheepish is it took, us, it took Joe and I about, and Walter about three months to convince Brent to be on this podium today and to accept the award that he'll receive from all of you from the Aspen board this evening. I thought what I want to do now is just ask Brent a few questions about, about the past and about his career, and then bring Condi and Joe in about the future. So Brent, you grew up in, yes, I please. think we're going to stop right now. It can only go downhill No, we're doing here. okay. <laughs> we're doing all right, Brent. So Brent, you grew up in, in Utah, in Ogden, Utah, um, and were a teenager during Pearl Harbor in the beginning years yeah. of the Second World War. What was it about your upbringing, about your parents, about your education that made you think about public service in West Point? I'm not sure there was anything specific. You know, I was, a, I was an avid Boy Scout, although I never made Eagle Scout. But really, when I was about 12 years old, I read a book called West Point Today. And I read it and I thought, that's where I want to go to college. And it had nothing to do with a military career or anything else. I just really liked what the cadets had to go through. And so that's it. And along with it came an obligation for X number of years of service. And I kept having <coughs> interesting and challenging jobs. So it turned into a 29-year career. And um, unlike a lot of other officers, both in the civil service and, and the military service, you found time, you took time, you carved it out to earn a master's and PhD from Columbia. Uh, were you thinking about intelligence? Were you thinking about a foreign policy leadership role in the future? Well, not, not exactly, no. What happened shortly after I became a pilot was I had to make a forced landing and I spent two years in the hospital. And the doctor said, you're never going to fly again. So I started thinking about things. And I decided the thing for me to do is to go into planning and strategy in the Air Force. And so I tried to do that. And I got the offer to go back to West Point to teach. So I did that. And then I got the PhD and uh, night and weekends work after that. And, and you found your way to the White House as military assistant to President Nixon. I want to ask you two questions about the Nixon administration. It's a long time since August 9th, 1974, the day that President Nixon uh, resigned his office. Not for me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, talk about the legacy of President Nixon as a foreign policy leader. 
I mean, he, he accomplished things that few other presidents have accomplished. We'll talk about the opening to China in a minute, in a minute but how do you see him now in 2011? Well, I, I see him in his public role basically the way I did then. He was a great strategic thinker, and I think he was a very good president. He had psychological problems that bedeviled him and led him to do things and to take attitudes that were not Richard Nixon. But he was very far-sighted. The notion of trying to change our relationship with China as a way to begin to deal with the whole Cold War syndrome uh, was a remarkable development. And uh, he pursued it. He wasn't an implementer. Henry Kissinger was the, was the implementer. He was the strategy, uh, strategizer. President Nixon. Yes, he, yeah. would, he was the conceptualizer. And then Nixon did the, I er, mean, uh, Kissinger did the, uh, uh, the execution. But it was a great team. Uh, they admired each other. They were both a little jealous of each other which got in the way of things. And th but those were the kinds of things which eventually led Richard Nixon uh, to his downfall. Margaret McMillan has written a book called Nixon and Mao about the opening to China. And she makes the point, she may be right, she may be wrong, that it was on the American side principally the vision of President Nixon for the opening to China and for the balancing of the Soviet Union at the time. What's your perspective on that? I think that's probably right. Uh, but at the same time we were reaching out to China, we also developed detente with the Soviet Union. Because the Soviet Union, of course, was immensely annoyed at this rapprochement with China, which was directed specifically against the Soviet Union and Soviet expansionism. So detente was a way to balance it off in a manner that improved U.S. position with both powers, and it worked for a time. You spoke about the team of Nixon and Kissinger. There was another team in which you were a central um, member, and that's the team of, of George H.W. Bush's presidency, a one-term presidency, but a remarkable presidency in, in, in international affairs, and I think as the years pass, the record that you achieved under President Bush's leadership with Jim Baker and with Bob Gates and others uh, really hasn't been matched since. If you think about ending the Cold War without a shot being fired, unifying Germany in NATO, which no one, I think, on November 9th, 89, would have predicted, and of course, the remarkable Gulf War coalition. So what was the secret of that team in terms of strategy, in terms of tacticians, implementers? I think the secret of that team was George H.W. Bush. I think he was the best prepared president we've ever had especially in foreign policy. Uh, he had been a member of Congress. He had been chairman of his party. He had been ambassador to the UN. And when he was ambassador to the UN, he used to walk around and visit all the other ambassadors. And he would say, you know, how, is your, how are things in your country? What do you think about the UN? What do you think about the United States? So he, he was learning about the world. Then he went from there to be our second representative to China, when China was as strange as the moon. We had no relationship with China for over 20 years. So he learned how to deal with a very alien culture with whom we had no contact. Then he came back and he became DCI, in charge of the intelligence of the country. And then he spent eight years as vice president. So during that time, he, he had learned about the world, about policy, about how different presidents operated. So when he came in, he had seen, he had seen National Security Council teams that worked and some that didn't work. And so I think he carefully chose his team. We had vociferous dif disagreements. But in the end, after we had finished arguing, and the president said, I think we ought to do that. No one ever demurred, no one ever went out 
in public or private and undercutting. So Brent, two more questions about, about the Bush administration, then I want to bring Joe and Condi into this conversation. What I remember when Condi and I worked for you in 1990 and 91 was this very masterful juggling of Gorbachev and Yeltsin. Gorbachev is a very strong first party secretary, Soviet president, and then gradually weakening over those years as Yeltsin, the Russian Republic president, rose to power, saved Gorbachev in August 1991. Talk about, th that was difficult to juggle two big egos, two different leaders in the same country. They were very, di they were very different leaders and we had a lot of public pressure to abandon Gorbachev in a way and to support Yeltsin because Yeltsin was a populist and he, 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 had a, he was a much more appealing figure. Gorbachev was a kind of a pros professorial type and he wasn't an inspired sp uh, speaker. What do you think? And, <laughs> no, no, I'm about, I'm about, I'm about, I'm about to tell you a story about Condi. So, uh, but anyway, we, we stuck with Yeltsin when, when uh, we stuck with Gorbachev. When Yeltsin first came to, the, uh, to Washington, uh, he was scheduled for a meeting with me. And his car drove up and Condi met him down at the entrance and he says, I'm not getting out of the car unless I'm going to see the president. So she said, your appointment's with General Scowcroft if you want to see him, fine. If not, there's the gate. So we did what we usually do with people like that. Uh, he came into my office, we had a conversation, and the president dropped by, which was a proper protocol. Because he was the Russian Republic president, but we were dealing no, with Gorbachev. No, he was just the mayor at that time. He was the mayor at that Ma time. Mayor of Moscow. But he wasn't president of the Soviet Union. No, he, yeah. he was not. Uh, but then, you know, I think it's, uh, I don't know if Condi agrees with me, but I think it's probably true that the Soviet Union may not have dissolved if it had not been for the enmity between those two. They started out as close friends, but they became bitter foes. Um, last question, and we'll come back, I know Condi wants to come back to this, this question. Um, if there's a criticism of President Bush 41 in foreign policy, often people say, well in 1991 as Yugoslavia began to disintegrate, there may have been an opportunity in the wake of the Gulf War Coalition to mount a similar North Atlantic, NATO uh, coalition to prevent the barbaric excesses of Milosevic uh, that ensued. Um, Jim Baker said famously, Secretary of State Baker, we don't have a dog in that fight. When you think what happened in the Clinton administration, the successful entry into Bosnia in 1995, stopping the war, but that war was four years, 250,000 dead, two million homeless. What do you think from this vantage point? Was it a mistake not to have gone in in 91 or 92? It was a terribly difficult time for us. And, 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 and I'll say we were, we were divided. There's no question about, uh, about that. Uh, Jim Baker, uh, early in 91, visited Yugoslavia and, uh, and made a statement in a speech that the Yugoslavs ought to stick together. They shouldn't break up. And he was accused back home in this country uh, as being against, against self-determination. Uh, then when, a, when conflict started, Larry Eagleburger and I, Larry had served in, in Yugoslavia as well, thought we ought to do something. Uh, the rest really didn't. What to do was very difficult, and I must admit, you know, having, having been an attaché in Yugoslavia and having traveled that country, it is, it is nirvana for guerrilla warfare. Mountainous, little, little roads, sharp corners, uh, it would have been a nightmare. Uh, when the Europeans finally, in, or when we actually applied air power and helped the Europeans, I think it was less that than it was that the Croatians had gotten their act together and they had a military force that could beat Milosevic. But that, that one, I have mixed feelings about. Uh, I tried myself to have us do more, especially in the air, than we did. But there was no appetite for it. And the Europeans also said, look, you guys took the lead in the Gulf War. This is in our backyard, let us. 
and most of us were only too happy to say, you bet. I think Jacques Pouy said the hour of Europe has arrived, and it hadn't, because the war went on for four years. That's right. Yeah. Um, let me bring Condi and Joe into this conversation. Condi, I wanted to ask, have you ask you a serious question about the Soviet Union, but first, I remember walking through the halls of the West Wing, and it's this wonderful tradition when the White House photographer takes photographs from trips, they, they're on the walls, and if you're the highest ranking person in that photo, you can take it. I remember a photograph of General Scowcroft asleep on Air Force One, uh -huh. and there was a notation from President Bush, there was some kind of award he gave. Yes, can yes. you talk about that, please? Yes, that Don't was you the, dare. That I am, I am, I am. It, it was the Scowcroft Award, we all knew that. Now to be fair, Brent worked incredibly long hours. I, I never knew anyone who worked as hard. Uh, there at 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning, there until 11, 11.30 at night, and, uh, and then a real family man who took care of an ailing wife um, when he went home, and so he deserved to sleep. But uh, there was one particular uh, time, and it comes from the story that Brent told you about Boris uh, Yeltsin, indeed. Boris Yeltsin uh, didn't want to go see that man, Scowcroft, but he ultimately uh, took his considerable self up the st stairs, uh, plopped down in Brent's office, and launched into a 40-minute monologue about what he was going to do uh, for the Soviet Union, everything from building housing to building railroads. I mean, it was really boring. Um, <laughs> he was so engaged in his own monologue that he did not notice that his interlocutor, Brent Scowcroft, had dozed off. <laughs> and uh, Yeltsin just kept right on talking, didn't bother him at all. <laughs> and, Brent woke up. Brent woke up when the president came by, come on. <laughs> Okay, Condi, now for the serious question. I'm gonna ask you and Joe the same question. From your, you worked for Brent, you were um, the senior um, the special assistant to the president and senior director for Soviet affairs, 89-91. Extraordinary timing, extraordinary time. Um, what's Brent's legacy as a public official? He's had this remarkable career, it goes back 65 years. There's hardly a person yeah. in our country yes. who has served this country for so long, at such a high level, with such great effectiveness. What's his legacy from your viewpoint? My view is that uh, Brent has a legacy as uh, a public servant in the two most important characteristics that a public servant can have, skill and decency. Uh, Brent, obviously, great intellect, um, able to bring very smart people together uh, to get to a solution to difficult problems. and. If you don't think there were difficult issues to solve in trying to shepherd the Soviet Union uh, to its death, even though it still had 30,000 nuclear weapons and 5 million men under arms, there were some really hard decisions that had to be made. And Brent was able to get the smart people, um, like Jim Baker and, and Dick Cheney, who was the, the Secretary of Defense, and, and uh, able to get people together around solutions to some of these very hard problems. And then, uh, something that a national security advisor really has to be able to do, and I know Steve Hadley and Sandy Berger, who's here, will understand this, uh, you have to be able to use the strengths of the president. And uh, Brent used the strengths of George H.W. Bush, who was really great one-on-one -on -one with a leader. Uh, I'll never forget the time that he convinced Helmut Kohl up at Camp David that Helmut Kohl was going to have to go out and say, Germany will be fully unified in NATO. And while that doesn't sound very startling now, imagine that in February of 1990 with the Soviet Union still in existence. It was very startling. So Brent was able to get people together around, uh, around ideas and, and execute them. But more importantly, just a person of great integrity and decency. Um, I don't think you will find anyone who ever believed that in dealing with Brent Scowcroft, he wasn't straight up with them. Uh, he said what he believed. Uh, he never said he would do something that he didn't do. Um, this is one of not just the best public servants um, uh, and most decent public servants I've ever known, but one of the most decent people. Joe, um, you had a different relationship. You founded the Aspen Strategy Group together. You served at high levels of government, usually when Brent was out of government. So you saw him from a different perspective, the bipartisan legacy. Well, I, I, I could first say that uh, on the question of Brent, 
legacy uh, as public figure. As Steve Hadley was talking, uh, we were talking at lunch, this. he has created the model of what a national security advisor should be. And as Steve pointed out, he not only did it under Ford, coming after a rather flamboyant national security advisor, but changed the model to a very effective model. And then uh, in the Tower Commission report, he wrote down what the job should be. And then under George H.W. Bush, he came back and did it exactly as it should be done. And when we teach American foreign policy at the Kennedy School, we tell the students, Brent Scowcroft is the model of how to do this job. So that's a legacy in addition to the substantive accomplishments of the Bush 41 administration, which I agree was a very impressive administration in foreign policy. But I, I would, I'll pick up your point about the outside of government, the Brent's legacy. Uh, in 1980, the previous consortium on arms control at the Aspen Institute uh, was ended. The, the people who were financing it refused to finance it anymore. It was, they said it was too academic. And Ed Deagle of the Rockefeller Brothers Foundation said, well, if you would like to help organize something that would be more policy oriented, more like the group of 30 in finance, um, I'll see if I can get some foundations to help finance it. And we talked about this and how we would do it. And we said, well, it's got to be a group of people who are going to rise above Washington partisan politics. It's got to be people who want to go someplace and talk seriously about national concerns. But it's also got to have a leader who symbolizes that, because that'll be the make or break. And so we said, well, who should we get? It took about 36 seconds to agree on Brent Scowcroft. Uh, but that, I mean, that sense that Brent Scowcroft represents what's best in the national interest, uh, well above partisan wrangling and politics, really marks him, uh, I think, as a, as a giant in, our, in American foreign policy, both in and, and out of office. So, so I think I would say that uh, uh, it's a very important legacy because God knows after what we've seen the last month or so in Washington, we need some more of that. But I, I, we praise Brent too much, and I, I feel it's only fair that I balance things off a little bit by, by alerting all the people in this audience that Brent has a very mean streak. Now, you might say, well, how could that be? And I'll tell you, it's because every year he challenges, or no, he invites members of the Aspen Strategy Group to go on a hike up one of these nice mountains with him. And uh, they look at Brent and look at his age and know that he survived an, an airplane crash, and they said, well, that'll be easy. And then he goes on one of these hikes, and he rushes up the mountain. And when he gets to the destination, he goes and climbs an even higher mountain behind it. And all these young whippersnappers are left lurking behind and saying, my God, did he do that just to embarrass us? <laughs> And we've never known the full answer to it, but I think the hypothesis of a mean streak might, might be tolerated. <laughs> uh, I don't have any response to that. <laughs> but I, I want to say one thing in my own defense. If I, have, if I have any talent at all, it's my number one requirement always is to get people around me who are smarter than I am. Now that's easy, but, uh, <laughs> but that is really the hallmark of what I have tried to do. And it has helped me, uh, this one of the shining examples right here, it, was helped. it has helped me inordinately in my career. Let me ask the three of you, I'm gonna go back to Joe's point about partisanship. We have just witnessed over the last months and weeks the most sorry example of a lack of good governance and a lack of strategy and foresight and frankly courage, certainly in my working lifetime. But my sense is, we're all involved in foreign policy, looking ahead past 2012, my sense is the differences between the two parties on foreign policy are more narrow than on domestic policy and the passions aren't quite as deep and quite as 
intense. Do you all agree with that? Is there hope that we might act as one overseas and that we might even go back to that old adage that politics should stop at the water's edge, Joe? Well, I, I think uh, we're not as badly divided on foreign policy as we have been on, on some domestic issues. Um, I hope you're right that that's the case, Nick. One, one question is, uh, as we actually get into implementation of questions like uh, budget cuts, and particularly military budget cuts, will, uh, will you get a fragmentation, for example, within the Tea Party movement? There isn't a single foreign policy position within the Tea Party. Ironically, that might help, because it might mean that instead of having a very powerful group of freshman Republican House members who've tugged John Boehner and sort of the traditional centrist Republicans to the right, if they're splintered, uh, there may be more room for the, the sort of the center of the Republican tendent party and the center of the Democratic Party to pull together. That, that might happen on foreign policy, but frankly, we haven't been tested yet. If, if, we, if this new Congressional Commission doesn't reach an agreement uh, and fails over something like revenues, and so you have this trigger in which you have to do these deep cuts in defense spending, uh, that might be the test. Brett and Condi, that, that question of partisanship. Well, I think uh, on the surface it's correct. Now, I'm not sure how deeply it goes because most of the controversial issues have been uh, on domestic policy. Uh, it's also, I think, because many of the foreign policy adventures, if we will, uh, our, our presence in Afghanistan and, and Pakistan were heavily supported by Republicans. Uh, and now you have a Democratic president, so that gives him a natural ally there. And in the, uh, uh, in the Libyan operation, uh, the same sort of thing happened. But I think you can, you can foretell in the Libyan operation, you know, there's been a pretty nasty debate uh, about the War Powers Act, and uh, all over the lot on it. So it, I think it remains to be seen whether, it's, whether your statement is true or whether it's just that it hasn't had the saliency. Condi. I'd make a couple of points. First of all, um, yeah, it's been kind of an ugly spectacle over the last month, but, but we have to remember, you know, our politics has always been a little rough in the United States. Um, in fact, it was uh, Thomas Jefferson who wrote a letter that he leaked that George Washington was senile because he didn't like the fact that he was dealing with Alexander Hamilton. I mean, we've always had a little edginess to our politics. I think it's been made more edgy by 24-hour news and cable news where uh, somebody's always shoving a microphone in somebody's face and saying, what do you think? And then if you are, uh, if later on you change your mind, then you flip-flopped or there's been compromise. So I think we've, our politics is sort of sped up and we have uh, structures, thanks to the founding fathers, that actually take time uh, to get to compromise and to do things. And I think we might, if we were able to pull back the curtain on a lot of the difficult issues that we've had, it might have lot, looked a lot uglier in, uh, than it, uh, way back, even for instance, the great civil rights legislation, I'll bet that didn't really look too pretty. You just didn't get to see it on cable news every night. And so um, some of this, I think, may just be the kind of megaphone of, of the press. Um, that said, I, I'm concerned too uh, that we hold together in foreign policy, but I'm actually more concerned about something else, and it's, it's something that Joe has uh, commented on some. I, I'm a little concerned that we, in the face of huge deficits, um, immigration policies that are really not very smart these days, uh, problems in our K-12 education system, that we're losing our sense of confidence that the American ideal really works at home. And if we lose that sense of confidence that it works at home, then we're not going to be prepared to defend those ideals abroad. And we're gonna leave a vacuum. And a vacuum in international politics uh, will be a very dangerous thing because either nobody will, fill, will fill it, in which case there'll just be chaos, or somebody will fill it whose values are not like our own. And so my concern is that we sort of get our domestic house in order so that we have a good basis from which to lead. And in that regard, 
While I am very uncomfortable with the idea of deep defense cuts, I would like to see the Pentagon get out ahead of this. $550 billion defense budgets are not sustainable in the United States. They're not sustainable. And people who say defense is off the table are making a mistake. We're going to have to do something uh, to bring our defense costs. And by the way, it's not the matter of the wars we're fighting. Those will, will come down. It's a question of whether or not the structure of our military really bears any resemblance to the international balance of power as it exists now rather than it existed in 1991 when we left. Let's uh, stay with that issue. Yeah. I want to come back to China and come back to America's role in the world, but this issue of the future of our defense establishment and our defense capabilities. Joe wrote an op-ed for the New York Times yesterday on this issue. Your views? Yeah, I, I tried to argue that, uh, that as you think about trimming the defense budget, uh, it matters a lot how you do it. Can you trim it? Absolutely. And, you know, if you look at American government today, it is odd. We have uh, a government where you have one agency with enormous capability, and I speak as a former Assistant Secretary of Defense. I'm not anti-defense in the least. But we have a government that consists of a giant and a lot of pygmies. And it's very hard for a giant and a pygmy to mate. And, you know, State Department with a $50 billion budget, uh, what did the Congress just do? They knocked out $8.5 billion from that budget as though this was some contribution to reducing a trillion dollar deficit problem. Uh, with the way we're thinking about this is, doesn't make much sense. We ought to be asking what the strategy is that we want to implement. And what I argued in this piece is we ought to go back to Dwight Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower said, avoid involvement in land wars in Asia and realize that a strong American economy is the basis for a strong defense. Uh, those pieces of advice strike me as good to this day. And I think that uh, uh, you, could, you can cut defense probably as much as 10%. It, after all, defense went up enormously in the, in the last decade after 9-11. Uh, it, you know, it, and it, could you cut that back uh, to a reasonable number in the range of a 10% cut? I think you can, you should. What, what I tried to argue in the, in the piece, though, is that it would be a huge mistake for America to draw back from places where we're wanted. I mean, if you look at East Asia, uh, Japan pays most of the costs of 50,000 troops that are forward based there to go through some sort of bring the troops home call uh, when this presence of American troops in Japan and Korea provides an insurance policy for these countries, which they're willing to pay for, and thereby gives us enormous leverage on the future of East Asia, which is going to be the great growth center of the world economy. That's a nutty way to cut defense. So a lot depends on how you cut defense. I agree with Condi, we should cut it, but I, I, I worry very much about people who are saying, oh, well then let's do 20% across the board or something, that worries me. No, I agree completely, Joe, and, and let me just uh, make clear, I'm a defense hawk, all right? I'm, an, I, I think, an avowed national security hawk. My concern is that if there's not a reasonable plan for sizing the defense budget to our current needs, there will be a lot of unreasonable plans for doing so, either across the board or something that simply looks like log rolling within the Pentagon or something that looks like uh, congressional favorites because they are in certain well-defended uh, dif districts, and I don't mean defended abroad, I mean defended in the Congress. And so um, I think we, I don't know what the number is, uh, probably for me 10% is too high for my blood, but I would think that we should be engaged in a debate that I would hope strong people who believe in defense could lead about how we bring the defense budget to a place that we can sustain it. And we all know that one of the problems is that a lot of those are a, a personnel costs, legacy personnel costs of health care and retirement benefits over a very, very long period of time. And, and so that's a hard problem to go after. Brent, so you have been, you're a career military officer. You've been in the integrating function of the White House. The president has called, he challenged the Pentagon weeks ago to cut $400 billion over the long term from the budget. Is Condi right that, that we should be more ambitious, that he should be more ambitious? I think we probably should be, because I think for a decade now, defense has essentially got whatever it asked for. Uh, you know, we've been 
fighting active wars in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and it's understandable. But now I think times are different. Uh, the Pentagon has had it easy for a long time, it hasn't had to justify it. And, but the worst thing we can do is say, across the board in the Pentagon, every take, everybody takes an eight or 10% cut. That would be a disaster. What we need to do is look at entitlements, look at those things separately. But on ter in terms of the mission, what does the world look like now? What is the United States likely to have to do? And what kind of forces will it take to do that? It may not be the same as the force structure that we decided on 15 years ago, 20 years ago at the end of, uh, of, of the Cold War. And those are the things that we have to focus on. So we're just about to commemorate the 10th anniversary of 9-11. Um, of and uh, we have to reflect back on Iraq and Afghanistan, all of us. Bob Gates, when he was leaving, as SecDef uh, said, and this got widespread attention around the globe, that we shouldn't fight major land wars in Asia in the future. Should we be that categorical? Can we be that categorical? How do you reflect back 10 years, and what lessons do you, do you derive from it? Well, I think that's, that's a little too narrow a description of it, although you know, we've, we've said since the beginning of the Korean War, we should never fight a land war uh, in, in Asia, and that's a pretty sensible thing to do since any war, any serious war there would involve China, and there we're at a serious disadvantage on the ground in a, in a land war. Uh, but no, I think what, what are the kinds of things that we need military force for now? And they're not the same as they were 20 years ago. And we need to analyze that. And some forces maybe need to be strengthened and some cut back. Uh, but we ought to do it in a way we've rarely done it before. Uh, we frequently done it. Well, uh, you know, our bombers are X number of years old, therefore we need a new bomber. Or, you know, we're supposed to have a 500-ship navy, it's down to 300. That's terrible. Well, that's an, an abstraction. But the other thing I worry about is in this budget agreement, the sort of thing hanging over their heads is if, if this special committee can't come up with something, there'd be cuts in what they call now a security budget, which puts State Department and Defense in the same budget, and that is a catastrophe. And one of the things, one of the smartest things Bob Gates ever said was, I'm prepared to give the State Department money from the Defense Department because its mission is so essential. Right. Um, thank you to all of you. I, we want to go to the audience for your questions and your views, but I, I, we have to talk about briefly two more, maybe the most important issues we face overseas. The first is China. China's rise into global power. It is competitive with us in many ways, but it also has a symbiotic economic relationship with us. It's unlike any other adversary, if you will, we've ever faced. How do we deal with China, keep the peace with China, keep us out of conflict with China in the future? Condi. Well, I would, uh, first of all, I do think that um, we have managed, um, we managed and we continue to manage a relatively uh, productive relationship with China, given the fact that usually uh, the international system doesn't accommodate rising powers very well. And uh, yet, I think there are a few who believe we really are going to get into a hot conflict with China. And so, uh, we, should, we should give some credit to the fact that the relationship uh, is productive, and for the most part, we've even been able to manage some of the very difficult tensions that have come out of what is now a quite asymmetric economic relationship with China. And we just have to keep doing that, and sometimes that's a day-to-day -day proposition. You know, you can have grand strategy. Some days, it's just solving the problem that's on the table with the Chinese, whether it's they forced down our aircraft over a, reconna a reconnaissance aircraft back in 2001, or we have to decide what to do about the call for calling them currency manipulation. I mean, uh, some of it's just day to day. But I think in this more strategic sense, what we want to do is we want to make first 
and foremost very clear that the United States is a Pacific power and intends to remain a Pacific power. Um, that may have some implications, as Brent was saying, for what our military structure looks like uh, going forward. Secondly, I think we want to strengthen and make certain that our alliances in Asia are strong. Um, I worry, frankly, a lot about Japan these days. This is um, a country that is the third largest economy. We need the Japanese to be a power in Asia, yet it sustains blow after blow after blow that seems to make it recede further and further into the background. South Korea, on the other hand, uh, is a vibrant uh, society. We have strong relationships in Southeast Asia, and we always have the Australians who we tend to forget to mention, but are really talk about punching your, above your weight. If you really want something done, the Aussies are almost always there. And so strengthening those alliances in Asia, I think, is very, very important. And then uh, third, it goes to this question of getting our own house in, in order. Um, I mentioned the kind of asymmetric economic relationship. I have to say, it's a little hard to swallow, you know, the, the Chinese going on and on about how we'd better get our economic house in order. The statement today, uh, the, the statement, public statement. Yeah, and, you know, every bone in my body wanted to say, um, you know, uh, when you can build bullet trains that don't run into one another, then you can talk to us. Uh, because I really do think that we have to be very careful, the Chinese should be very careful, uh, not to uh, overplay a certain advantage. And when I talk to Chinese leaders, they speak in a very different tone of voice because they recognize that they have huge problems at home. This has been the most rapid economic and social transformation in human history and they've done it with a billion three people. It's a miracle. When I first went to China, the streets of Beijing were a competition between a few horse carts, a few automobiles, and a whole lot of bicycles. And that's not, that was 1988. That's not Beijing today. So they have an economic miracle underway, and that is to be applauded. But they know that there are tremendous tensions underneath. All of those people coming from those 19th century villages into the cities, product safety problems of the kind that they've had with baby milk formula or with, this, uh, with the stimulus that produced a lot of projects that are now turning out to have been shoddy. And it's also true that the Chinese are not showing great confidence when they are tapping into trying to hack into everybody's server to get at that last human rights advocate who might be online somewhere out in Shenzhen province. And so they know that they are still a developing society. They know that their outward reach uh, has first and foremost to pay attention to their inward harmony, as they would call it, the harmonious society. And so I think one thing that we can do is not buy into the myth of a China that is so ascendant that it will simply fly right past us. If the United States does the things that we need to do, get our own internal house in order, strengthen our alliances in Asia, and make certain that our military capabilities are, are uh, appropriate for the time, then I think we will be just fine in managing the rise of China and could even welcome then uh, a China that could help to solve some of the problems in the international system, as frankly they, uh, from time to time, helped us do with North Korea. Thank you. Joe, your recent book, The Future of Power, dealt in part with this big, big issue. Your views? Yeah, I, I agree with what Condi just said. I think the greatest danger we have is overestimating China and China overestimating itself. Um, you know, it, the, uh, if you go back to World War I uh, and what was the cause of World War I, it's often said it was the rise in the power of Germany and the fear it created in Britain. And there are a number of people who are saying that's going to be the story of the 21st century, the rise in the power of China and the fear it creates in the U.S. It's bad history and bad analysis because, in fact, Germany had passed Britain by 1900. China is nowhere close to the United States. There was a Pew poll a month or two ago that the Wall Street Journal published saying that half the American people think that China's ahead. This is nonsense. If you look at the World Economic Forum ranking of economies and competitiveness, the U.S. is number four behind Switzerland, Sweden, and Singapore. China is number 27. If you take uh, ratings of entrepreneurial rankings, the U.S. is number one. We have tremendous problems right now with getting our financial house in order. 
But let's face it, the Chinese, can't, they can complain all they want, but if they really were so strong, what they could do was make the renminbi a reserve currency. They can't because they're unwilling to allow, that authoritarian government is unwilling to allow the economic freedom at home, which would be required to make it a reserve currency. Uh, so the, this, this magnification of China, which creates fear in the US and hubris in China is the biggest danger we face. What we have to realize is that China is going to be difficult to manage. It's gonna be difficult to manage over a couple of decades. But I think uh, the US will stay ahead. I mean, I'm, I give a lot of facts and figures for this in, in the book about why I think the US will stay stronger than China in overall power relations over the next couple of decades. But uh, I also quote there a, a very interesting uh, talk I had with Lee Kuan Yew, which goes to the point that Condi made about immigration. I, we were having lunch and I asked him, uh, do you think China is going to pass the United States? Well, he's a pretty shrewd observer of both China and the United States. He said, no, he says, I think they're gonna give you a run for your money, but I don't think they're gonna pass you. And I said, why not? He said, well, China can draw on a talent pool of 1.3 billion people, but the United States can draw on a talent pool of 7 billion people. And what's more, you can recombine them with a diversity which creates much more creativity than ethnic Han nationalism will ever permit. And that goes to Connie's point. If we keep our own values intact and keep ourselves open to the rest of the world, I don't think China's gonna pass us. Thank you. Brent, 40 year perspective on China. Just, uh, just a couple of words. I, I agree with both my colleagues. I, I would say that the most successful US foreign policy of the past 40 years has been China policy because since Richard Nixon went to China, every president, Republican and Democrat, some of them starting out with some very strong views about China, have come to the conclusion that broadening and deepening our relationship with China is in our fundamental interest. And we need to do it from a standpoint of maturity. The Chinese are going through, in many ways, a revolution. Uh, they, they've had an enormously successful economic program. Deng Xiaoping threw away Marxism and said, I don't care whether a cat's black and white as long as it catches mice and so on. That's been a tremendous success. The political system hasn't really kept up with it. And I think we need to be mature. We need to stand for what we think is right, but be prepared not to react sharply to every kind of little thing that the Chinese may do in a fit of pique or something. Good. Um, now you see why he's being awarded tonight by the Aspen Institute. Thank you, Brent. Thanks, Condi. Thanks, Joe. So we have about 20, 25 minutes. And um, if you'd like to stand up and pay tribute to Brent, you're most welcome. If you'd like to ask a Not question, really. If, you, uh, really, if you'd like to ask a question, that's great. Just please state your name. Uh, and we'll begin with Ambassador Stuart Bernstein. Congratulations, uh, General, and thank you for your service. Uh, knowing how close you are with the Bush family, I remember not too long ago, uh, well, it was a little while ago, that you wrote a, a editorial uh, not criticizing the George W. Bush administration. Can you give us any background on that? And did Condi call you up and say what's going on or what the story was about that? I got taken to the woodshed, okay? <laughs> uh, that, was, uh, that was an issue that I was troubled by. Uh, Condi and I had what was obviously a misunderstanding, which I didn't think was going to happen. Uh, but uh, what, I was, what I was really trying to say is, don't rush into a conflict in Iraq. That Saddam is really contained. Saddam really wasn't behind Al-Qaeda and 9-11. 
and we have a lot of issues there. Be careful. And uh, well, I'll let I'll let Condi give her side of it. <laughs> well, first of all, the first thing you should understand is that um, Brent and I are. He is my mentor, and we are great friends. And so we could have that conversation in a very open way. Uh, that probably if we had not known very, each other very well, we couldn't. And I just said that I thought, I only said, Brent, you know, I, I wish you'd just come and sat down and told me those things. And he said, you know, he felt that he wanted to make the case uh, publicly. Uh, we didn't agree. Uh, we didn't think we were rushing into war. We thought that Saddam had been through 16 Security Council resolutions over a period of 10 years. Um, we talked about some of the signs that he, in fact, was not contained um, and why we felt that we had to do something about him. Uh, not because he'd been the person who had, had supported al-Qaeda. I didn't believe that. The intelligence agencies didn't believe that. But he was a cancer in the Middle East and um, a cancer in the Middle East that had to be dealt with. And um, whether or not one agrees with your best friend and friends and mentors on those things, you can have open discussions about them. And, uh, fortunately, um, we did. <laughs> I have to tell you the story about how I met Condi. It was in the middle 80s, and I, I was out at Lawrence Livermore Laboratories giving a speech on nuclear policy, and some of the arms control gurus at Stanford asked me to come over and have dinner with them. And we were discussing all the elements of nuclear deterrence and um, Minutemen vulnerability, all of those things. And here, with all these gray beards, was this girl who looked like an undergraduate rather than a lecturer at uh, Stanford, which she was. And she stood up for her point of view, articulately, carefully, uh, with all of her colleagues here. And I said, that's somebody I need to get to know better and to cultivate. And that started a relationship which has been a fantastic one. Oh. Lester, Lester Crown. Can you give us your evaluation of what you think the relative powers are within Iran today and what our position ought to be? You have, you really come up with the easy ones, Lester. What I ever do to you? <laughs> uh, I think Iran is actually in a, it's too strong to say fragile condition, but it's in a very difficult position. There are three basic power centers in, in Iran. There is the government, which is the least powerful, run by Ahmadinejad and, and the legislature. They make the laws and so on. The real governing power uh, is, uh, are the mullahs. And uh, uh, the grand mullah Ayatollah uh, Khamenei can overturn legislation, can overturn decrees of the government. That is the real power, and it is a Sharia power. It is a, a religious state. The third is the IRGC, and the IRGC is, uh, is a tough, nasty organization. It exists alongside. The Iranians also have an Army, Navy, and an Air Force. This is a complete duplicate of the Army, Navy, and the Air Force. I think my sense is they have accreted in power. Ahmadinejad is in serious trouble now. Uh, he, I don't know whether he'd be cashiered, but he, he's, in, he's in trouble now. Uh, whether Khamenei is or not, I don't know. But he, he has difficulty balancing. Now, what should our policy be? I think that we certainly do not want Iran to develop nuclear weapons. I think it is important, less because another state would have a handful of nuclear weapons, than if Iran 
develops a nuclear weapon. I think you can be sure the Egyptians in self-defense will feel they have to, the Saudis will feel they have to, the Turks will feel they have to. Pretty soon we have a world which is not nearly as attractive. Now, can we dissuade them? I don't know. But it seems to me what we ought to be talking to them about is say, look, we know you live in a difficult neighborhood. You're a Shia Muslim power in a Sunni neighborhood. You're a Persian culture in basically an Arab neighborhood. We understand you have problems. We're prepared to work with you for a security system in the region which will solidify stability. But you can't go ahead uh, the way you're going. Will it work? I don't know. If I could just add one thing to what Brent has said. What reassures me a bit as we look ahead on this issue is that there has been a nearly seamless transition between George W. Bush, Condoleezza Rice, Barack Obama, and Hillary Clinton on this issue. There are differences. But essentially, both administrations have wanted to negotiate, tried to negotiate, have had Iran turn that down, so we've had to follow this dual policy of negotiations and pressure and sanctions. On the other hand, I'm a little bit reassured that we've had some continuity in an era that hasn't known a lot of it. Uh, that's one good thing to say, but it's a difficult, difficult problem. Well, one, one, of the, one of the real problems is who do you negotiate with? Who can you talk to who can deliver? That's a very hard part, part of the problem. Chris Howard. Here's a softball, General. I I'm here to praise you, so. <laughs> a very small question to the very end. Chris Howard, I'm the president of Hampton Sydney College, just south of, uh, of uh, Richmond, Virginia. Our newest graduate is Nick Burns, who we gave an honorary degree to. It's a good way to get invited to the Aspen Strategy Group <laughs> if you give the director an honorary degree. But Nick, thank you for the invitation. Um, so I, my formative years were down, General, as you know, now at the Air Force Academy. And I just wanted to say that there's a couple of Zoomies over here, I think, some Air Force Academy guys. The good looking right ones here. right over there, great. No West Point, no Navy, just Air Force, there we go. <laughs> and my Air Force classmate sitting right next to me right here. And uh, it's exciting uh, because just going back and thinking about the formative years, political science uh, uh, major at the Air Force Academy and looking for role models. And two people spring to mind. One of them was General Goodpaster, who came and spoke to us, I think, our sophomore year, and was just amazing. Just a statesman, balanced, thoughtful, as Nick, you're pointing out, just a true public servant who served under Eisenhower, served in NATO, and just served for America. And then for you to come along, and you know, we admire you from afar, General Scowcroft, and knew you had an Air Force background, but the one thing that I think that Nick Burns didn't mention is that you actually ran the Air Force Academy Political Science Department. So that was enough to brag on right there. <laughs> we thank you for that, thank you for your service. Fast forward very quickly, just advising some of the uh, Air Force Academy faculty on some new programs they were doing. They had a program called, I think they have, it's called Statesmen. They're trying to produce not just warriors and airmen, they're trying to produce statesmen at the Air Force Academy. And the, when I got a chance to make my little plea, I said, let's, let's, build, let's build some Brent Scowcrofts. So I just wanted to praise you in that regard. Thank you for your leadership. My one question is, as the National Security Advisor, if, when you served in the Ford administration, I think you served in uniform, if I, if I have it correctly. My question has to do, the, the national security advisor role, being a uniformed person in military versus being non-military, and your observations on the challenges of being in uniform or out of uniform, and I'm sorry if my, my history is a little twisted, I can't remember if you had resigned your commission right when you became national security advisor, if you did it both ways, and of course, Secretary Rice could obviously have a comment as well as Sandy Berg, thank you. Yeah, when I became national security advisor, there was a statute that said military officers on active duty may not hold civil office. Well, nobody knew what that meant, but uh, Al Haig had just left his chief of staff and gone back, uh, chief of staff to, uh, uh, to President Ford, and gone back to be vice chief of staff of the Army, and there was a lot of bitterness about that. So I, uh, retired at that point. I think it was the right thing to do because one of the one of the problems is the national security advisor has to be in a sense the arbiter. Well, if you're sitting there with a the uniform on, you're hardly looked at as impartial by a good part of the NSC system. 
So I thought it was the right thing to do. Uh, and it's gone both ways since then. We have time for two more questions. Yes, sir. The mic will be coming just in one, there it is. We've talked about the U.S. and China somewhat at length, and yet there has not been a single mention of that dirty word, Taiwan. How are we going to get out of that? Ambassador Cattle, let me apologize. I couldn't quite see with the lights, but thank you, Ambassador, for asking that question. Brent, there's a decision. The, the Obama administration has to I decide don't. whether to sell F-16s to Taiwan. Henry didn't ask me the question. He, I, just he looked right at you. <laughs> Uh, I think that uh, it still is the most vexing problem we face with the Chinese. Things in the past th several years uh, have gone much better with Taiwan since uh, the Taiwanese president, Chen Shui bian has left. Uh, the, the present president uh, doesn't talk about independent Taiwan independence. Uh, they've, they've restored direct flights. They're, things are going well, uh, but the whole issue of arms sales to Taiwan is a difficult one. Uh, the Taiwan Relations Act requires us to give adequate aid to Taiwan given the military balance. Well, the military balance has been shifting. There's no question about that. What I have suggested to the Chinese as well as to our own government, that we try to, to reverse this policy, that the Chinese deploy some more missiles against Taiwan, and so we sell more aircraft or submarines and so on. If the Chinese would take some steps to dismantle some of their forces directed against Taiwan, then we could reciprocate by saying the Taiwanese don't need these extra forces. Uh, so far, I haven't had much luck uh, with it, although I've gotten a respectful hearing from the, from the Chinese. Right now, however, we do face a, a crisis that Taiwanese have asked for uh, new F-16s, uh, it, it's, it's a domestic crisis as well because if uh, Lockheed Martin can't get a sale of the F-16, the plant in Texas is going to close. So that's uh, tens of thousands of jobs. So it's a very, very sensitive issue right now. But in the long term, I think it, it barring some catastrophe, it will work its way out in some kind of an indefinite sort of a relationship between the two of them. Walter, we're gonna ask, you'll ask the last question, then I'll ask Joe and Condi also for a final word. Uh, what, what should the United States be doing with the Israeli-Palestinian issue as we go into September and October? Thanks a lot, Walter. <laughs> That's next year's Aspen Strategy Group, not this year's. <laughs> I, I'm a I, I'm afraid that on this one, um, I think we may be stuck for a significant period of time, although I hope not. Uh, the key is just to get the two talking again. Uh, I, I don't believe that anything but direct bilateral negotiations between the parties will ever solve this problem. And uh, that means you have to find a formula by which the two can sit down. I'm still hoping that the Palestinians will not go to the UN uh, and do what they are uh, intending to do, to declare unilateral, unilaterally uh, statehood, because it has no meaning and it ultimately will not help them and it will drive the Israelis, I think, further away. But the fact of the matter is there really isn't any other solution to this problem than a two-state solution. The democratic state, do it, democratic Jewish state of Israel and the Palestinian state living side by side. Now, the fact is, and Walter, you had um, quite a bit to do with this, Salam Fayyad, um, as the Prime Minister of uh, the Palestinian territories, really only the West Bank, went a long way to creating the institutions, democratic institutions, decent institutions, institutions that were serving the people, institutions that were not corrupt, 
security forces that were not riddled with terrorists, that give you a glimpse of what a democratic Palestine could look like. And I think even the Israelis would say that if Palestine is going to look like that, then there's a good reason to move forward with uh, negotiations. And so while we are trying to get them back to the table on whatever basis, 67, 67 with swaps, 67 with swaps uh, and population realities on the ground, whatever we say, we've got to somehow keep that process of building the internal institutions of the Palestinians on track. And I'm more worried that the absence of active political negotiations will stall the quite significant remaking of the West Bank that has taken place. Not only is the West Bank growing economically at 9% last year, which is pretty remarkable, but these institutions are really prospering. And you don't see Palestinians in the West Bank just dying to get into Gaza where Hamas uh, is the power. And so um, I would say keep working at the on the ground stuff, keep pressing the Israelis to get rid of the outposts and move the barriers, all the hard work that you have to do, and then somehow get them back to the table because I'm, I'm fearful that that on the ground process won't last in the absence of an active political track. I think, thank you for that question, Walter. Uh, I think when Condi was in office, she did 99% of what needs to be done. I think the one thing that, in addition, needs to happen is the two states are so different in their domestic situations and in their power balance. I don't think the two of them sitting down together will ever come to an agreement. I think the United States needs to lay out the conditions. Everybody knows what they are now and say, we believe this is a just and honorable solution. We will get support from almost all of the Europeans for it, and perhaps even from the Russians, and that would be enough to push it over. Let's leave on a positive and uplifting note. Let me just ask I mean, very quickly. Palestinian Israelis aren't uplifting? Uh, well, the situation <laughs> is not as uplifting as we like. We've got two minutes, I think, Mr. Chairman. So with Joe, and then Condi, and then finally Brent, um, I think I know the answer to this question, but it should be asked because we've got so many challenges out there in an era of globalization. Should Americans be hopeful that 50 years from now, we will be the preeminent country in the world we all want to be? Starting, and Joe has written extensively about this. Yeah, I tend to be a long-run optimist on the future of the United States uh, for a whole variety of reasons that I can't spell out now, but uh, I think there's a, the Americans have a tremendous tendency, perhaps it's our Puritan origins, to uh, worry about our future. And we go through cycles of declinism. After Sputnik, the Soviets were 10 feet tall. In the 80s, uh, the Japanese were 10 feet tall. Today, the Chinese are 10 feet tall. I suspect that in the middle of this century, it'll be the Americans who are 10 feet tall. But I, I want to end uh, just by saying that um, I've been very fortunate to have Brent Scowcroft as a friend for 30 years, and the country's been fortunate to have him as a friend for much longer than that. Um, I'm an optimist, um, I think in part because I'm an American. Um, I, um, we are, Despite ourselves, despite worrying about our, about our future, I think we're a pretty optimistic people in general, and we have reason to be, because uh, so many times, as I've said many times, what seemed impossible at one moment seems inevitable in retrospect. Um, during 2006, which was pretty miserable for us, um, I read the biographies of the Founding Fathers, and I kept thinking, you know, by all rights, the United States of America should actually never have come into being, with a third of George Washington's troops down to smallpox and the Founding Fathers squabbling. And then we had a civil war, uh, hundreds of thousands of Americans dead on both sides, and yet, brother against brother, and yet we emerged a more perfect union. And then, uh, you know, you can't help but come across the continental divide and think about those people who uh, came across the continental divide in covered wagons. You know, they had to be optimistic. They didn't even know what was on the other side. They kept going. And, uh, and then I always say, you know, I was a little girl growing up in Birmingham, Alabama, where my parents could not 
take me to a movie theater or to a restaurant. Uh, but they had me absolutely convinced that I might not be able to have a hamburger at the Woolworths lunch counter, but I could be President of the United States if I wanted to be, and I became the Secretary of State. So we have a history of being able to do impossible things and make them look inevitable in retrospect. And uh, that brings me to a closing comment that I'd like to make about my good friend and mentor, Brent. Um, it is also the case that when uh, Brent was a young cadet, uh, if anyone had said, let me tell you what's going to happen. On uh, November 9th, uh, 10 of uh, 1989, the Berlin Wall is going to come down. Not a shot's going to be fired. And oh, by the way, in 1991, the hammer and sickle is going to come down from above the Kremlin for the last time. 75 years of communism, never mind. And in 2006, an American president is going to go to a NATO summit in Latvia. They might have had you committed if you'd said that. <laughs> And so, again, as much as we have domestically, internationally, we've also made the uh, impossible seem inevitable. So I am optimistic in the long run that we will be uh, preeminent in our own uh, way for a long time. But it will require um, that there will be uh, generations more of people like Brent Scowcroft, uh, people who are willing to put themselves on the line, people who are willing to be in public service, and people who are willing to do it uh, with the skill and good humor and integrity that you have, Brent. Thank you. And Brent, we're going to give you the final word, but I just want to say on behalf of all of us who served in the career military, career civil service, career foreign service, we never had a better leader and a more inspiring leader over the last 65 years. And when we saw you, Joe and I, up at Independence Pass at 11,500 feet <laughs> last summer, we all knew what a great, great man you are. Thank you. I want to thank everyone here for this tribute. It's, I'm very humbled by it. It's the people around me who deserve it. But uh, it's been a wonderful trip. I'm one of the luckiest guys alive. And I've got more friends than I can possibly count. And the Aspen Strategy Group and the Aspen Institute are right at the top of that list. God bless you, and thank you so much for this. Thank you.